Hey everybody, we are back with our book Holes by Louis Sacker. So we have now made it to chapter seven of our book. And if you are watching this with someone, I want you to take a minute and go through what you remember of the book so far. So pause the video and talk with each other. What has happened so far that you remember? And now, here goes my quick review. Holes is about a boy named Stanley Yelnance. Stanley was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And we learn that they think he stole a famous baseball player's tennis shoes. They literally fell from the sky and hit Stanley in the head. But... The judge didn't believe him, so he said he could go to jail or go to Camp Green Lake. Well, the thing about Camp Green Lake is it is camp for bad boys, so boys that have gotten into trouble. And the other thing about Camp Green Lake, there is not a lake, nor is anything green. It's a desert. The boys have to dig a hole every day. They said that it will help them build character and become better people. So, we learn a couple other things about Stanley. His dad is an inventor who is trying to figure out how to recycle rubber tennis shoes. And he has a great-great-grandfather who made a deal with a woman named Madame Zeroni, and he accidentally didn't follow through. So their family is cursed, and they call him their no good, dirty, rotten, pig stealing great great grandfather. One other thing that we have learned about Stanley's past is his great grandfather had his fortune stolen by kissing Kate Barlow in the Wild West. Now, we have just read about how Stanley has completed his first ever hole, and he's pretty exhausted. But let's see what comes next in chapter eight of Holes. Enjoy! Chapter eight. A lot of people don't believe in curses. A lot of people don't believe in yellow spotted lizards either. But if one bites you, it doesn't make a difference whether you believe in it or not. Actually, it's kind of odd that scientists name the, yellow, the lizard after its yellow spots. Each lizard has exactly 11 yellow spots, but the spots are hard to see on its yellow-green body. The lizard is from 6 to 10 inches long and has big red eyes. In truth, its eyes are yellow, and it is the skin around the eyes which are red, but everyone always speaks of its red eyes. It also has black teeth and a milky white tongue. Looking at one, you would have thought that it should have been named a red-eyed lizard or black-toothed lizard or perhaps a white-tongued lizard. If you've ever been close enough to see a yellow spot, you're probably dead. The yellow-spotted lizards like to live in holes, which offer shade from the sun and protection from predatory birds. Up to 20 lizards may live in one hole. They have strong, powerful legs and can leap out of very deep holes to attack their prey. They eat small animals, insects, certain cactus thorns, and the shells of sunflower seeds. Chapter 9 Stanley stood in the shower and let the cold water pour over his hot, sore body. It was four minutes of heaven. The second day in a row, he didn't use soap. He was too tired. There was no roof over the shower building, and the walls were raised up six inches off the ground except for corners. There was no drain in the floor. The water ran out under the walls and evaporated quickly in the sun. He put on his clean set of orange clothes and returned to his tent, put his dirty clothes in the crate, got out his pen and box of sta stationery, and headed to the rec room. The sign on the door said W-R-E-C-K, Wreck. 
room. Nearly everything in the room was broken, or a wreck. The TV, the pinball machine, the furniture, even the people looked broken, with their worn-out bodies sprawled over various chairs and sofas. X-ray and armpit were playing pool. The surface of the table reminded Stanley of the surface of the lake. It was full of bumps and holes because so many people had carved their initials into the felt. There was a hole in the far wall, and an electric fan had been placed in front of it. Cheap air conditioning. At least the fan worked. As Stanley made his way across the room, he tripped over an outstretched leg. Hey, watch it, said an orange lump in the chair. You watch it, muttered Stanley, too tired to care. What did you say? the lump demanded. Nothing, said Stanley. The lump rose. He was almost as big as Stanley and a lot tougher. You said something. He poked his fat finger in Stanley's neck. What did you say? A crowd quickly formed around them. Be cool, said X-Ray. He put his hand on Stanley's shoulder. You don't want to mess with the caveman, he warned. The caveman is cool, said Armpit. I'm not looking for trouble, Stanley said. I'm just tired, that's all. The lump grunted. X-Ray and Armpit led Stanley over to the couch. Squid slid over to make room for Stanley to sit down. Did you see what the caveman did back there? X-Ray said. The caveman's one tough dude, said Squid, and he lightly punched Stanley's arm. Stanley leaned back against the torn vinyl upholstery. Despite his shower, his body still radiated heat. I wasn't trying to start anything, he said. The last thing he wanted to do was go after killing himself all day on the lake to get in a fight with a boy named the Caveman. He was glad X-Ray and Armpit had come to the rescue. How'd you like your first hole? asked Squid. Stanley groaned, and the other boys laughed. Well, the first hole's the hardest. No way, said X-Ray. The second hole's a lot harder. You're hurting before you even get started. If you think you're sore now, just wait till you feel tomorrow morning, right? That's right, said Squid. Plus, the fun's gone, said X-Ray. The fun? said Stanley. Don't lie to me, said X-Ray. I bet you always wanted to dig a big hole, right? Am I right? Stanley had never really thought about it before, but he knew better than to tell X-Ray he wasn't right. Every kid in the world wants to dig a great big hole, said X-Ray. To China, right? Right, said Stanley. See what I mean, said X-Ray. That's what I'm saying. But now the fun's gone, and you still got to do it again, and again. And again. Camp fun and games, said Stanley. What's in the box? Asked Squid. Stanley had forgotten he brought it. A paper. I was going to write a letter to my mother. Your mother? Laughed Squid. She'll worry if I don't. Squid scowled. Stanley looked around the room. It was one place in camp where the boys could enjoy themselves. And what did they do? They wreck it. The glass on the TV is smashed, as if someone had put his foot through it. Every table and chair seemed to be missing at least one leg. Everything leaned. He waited to write his letter until after Squid had gotten up and joined the game of pool. Dear Mom, today was my first day at camp, and I've already made some friends. We've been out on the lake all day, so I'm pretty tired. Once I pass the swimming test, I'll learn how to water ski. I... He stopped writing as he became aware of somebody reading over his shoulder. He turned to see Zero, standing behind the couch. I don't want her to worry about me, he explained. Zero said nothing. He just stared at the letter with a serious, almost angry look on his face. Stanley slipped it back into the stationery box. Did the shoes have red X's on the back? Zero asked him. It took Stanley a moment. But then he realized Zero was asking about Clyde Livingston's shoes. Yes, they did, he said. He wondered how Zero knew that. Brand X was a popular brand of sneakers. Maybe Clyde Livingston made a commercial for them. Zero stared at him for a moment, with the same intensity with which he had been staring at the letter. 
Stanley poked his finger through a hole in the vinyl couch and pulled out some stuffing. He wasn't aware of what he was doing. Come on, caveman, dinner, said Armpit. You come a caveman, said Squid. Stanley looked around to see that Armpit and Squid were talking to him. Uh, sure, he said. He put the piece of stationery back in the box, then got up and followed the boys out to the tables. The lump wasn't caveman. He was. He shrugged his left shoulder. At least it was better than barf bag. Chapter 10 Stanley had no trouble falling asleep, but morning came much too quickly. Every muscle and joint in his body ached as he tried to get out of bed. He didn't think it was possible, but his body hurt more than it had the day before. It wasn't just his arms and his back, but his legs, ankles, waist also hurt. The only thing that got him out of bed was knowing that every second he wasted meant it was one second closer to the rising of the sun. He hated the sun. He could hardly lift his spoon at breakfast, and then he was out on the lake, his spoon replaced by a shovel. He found a crack in the ground and began his second hole. He stepped on the shovel blade and pushed on the very back of the shaft with the base of his thumb. It hurt less than trying to hold the shaft with his blistered fingers. As he dug, he was careful to dump the dirt far away from the hole. He needed to save the area around the hole for when the hole was much deeper. He didn't know if he would ever get that far. X-ray was right. The second hole was the hardest. It would take a miracle. As long as the sun wasn't out yet, he removed his cap and used it to help protect his hands. Once the sun rose, he would have to put it back on his head. His neck and forehead had been badly burned the day before. He took it one shovelful at a time and tried not to think of the awesome task that lay ahead of him. After an hour or so, his sore muscles seemed to loosen up a little bit. He grunted as he tried to stick his shovel into the dirt. The cap slipped out from under his fingers and the shovel fell free. He let it lie there. He took a drink from his canteen. He guessed that the water truck should be coming soon, but he didn't finish all the water, just in case he was wrong. He'd learned to wait until he saw the truck before drinking the last drop. The sun wasn't yet up, but the rays arched over the horizon and brought light to the sky. He reached down to pick up his cap, and there next to it he saw a wide, flat rock. He put his cap on his head and continued to look down at the rock. He picked it up to see it was a fish, fossilized in it. He rubbed off some of the dirt, and the outline of the fish became clearer. The sun peeked over the horizon, and he could actually see tiny lines where every one of the fish's bones had been. He looked at the barren land all around him. True, everyone referred to this area as the lake, but it was still hard to believe that this dry wasteland was once full of water. Then he remembered what Mr. Sir and was what Mr. Pendansky had both said. If he dug up anything interesting, he should report it to one of them. If the warden liked it, he would get the rest of the day off. He looked back down the fish. He'd found his miracle. He continued to dig, though very slowly, as he waited for the water truck. He didn't want to bring attention to his find, afraid that one of the other boys might try and take it from him. He tossed the rock face down beside his dirt pile, as if it had no special value. A short while later, he saw the cloud of dirt heading across the lake. The truck stopped and the boys lined up. They always lined up in the same order. Stanley realized, no matter who got there first. X-Ray was always at the front of the line. Then came Armpit, Squid, Zigzag, Magnet, and Zero. Stanley got in line behind Zero. He was glad to be at the back, so no one would notice the fossil. His pants had very large pockets, but the rock still made a bulge. Mr. Pendansky filled each boy's canteen, until Stanley was the only one left. I found something, Stanley said, taking it out of his pocket. Mr. Pendansky reached for the Stanley's canteen, but Stanley handed him the rock instead. What's this? It's a fossil, said Stanley. See the fish? Mr. Pendansky looked again. See, you can see all of its little bones, said Stanley. 
Interesting. Let me have your canteen. Stanley handed it to him. Mr. Pendansky filled it, then returned it. So, do I get the rest of the day off? What for? You know, you, you said if I found something interesting, the Warren Morden would give me the rest of the day off. Mr. Pendansky laughed as he gave the fossil back to Stanley. Sorry, Stanley. The warden isn't interested in fossils. Let me see that, said Magnet, taking the rock from Stanley. Stanley continued to stare at Mr. Pendansky. Hey, Zigzag, dig this rock. Cool, said Zigzag. Stanley saw his fossil being passed around. I don't see nothing, said X-Ray. He took off his glasses, wiped them on his dirty clothes, and put them back on. See, look, a little fishy, said Armpit. And that is where we are going to end for today. I hope you enjoyed those chapters. Let's get into some discussion questions. What would probably happen if you were ever close enough to see the yellow dots on a yellow spotted lizard? You would not be living much longer. Those are very poisonous, and if they bit you, not good. Explain why the sign in the rec room is spelled rec, like as in wreck it Ralph, <laughs> as in completely tearing something up. Why do you think it was called that? Called a wreck. So a mess. Because everything in there was a mess. The boys had smashed everything. All the chairs had a leg broken off. Nothing was in good condition. Why, in X-Ray's opinion, was the second hole hardest to dig? Because you're sore. Have you ever done something like maybe... You did some special exercises or you went on a long walk and the next morning you feel it. Oh, everything hurts. Could you imagine having to do that same thing again the next day? That is what happened to Stanley. He had to do the digging all over again. What did Stanley think would happen after he found the fossil. He was hoping it was something the warden was looking for, right? And he would get a whole day out of digging. Not exactly what the warden was looking for though. So we'll have to see if anyone finds anything else. And that is our discussion for chapters eight nine and ten of holes so i hope you've enjoyed this part of the book and we will see you all next time bye everyone